Hello, my name is Professor Mike Osborne and I'm President of the Royal College of Pathologists. I'd like to welcome you today to the new Trainee Day. Pathology is hugely important. 95% of every single healthcare interaction in the United Kingdom is underpinned by a pathology test, ranging from blood tests to histology to a multitude of other tests which pathology offers. We are 17 specialties in pathology and we welcome everybody from everywhere who is part of the pathology family to be represented by the college and I would welcome you today. Our 17 subspecialties cover a diverse range of interests and areas of healthcare. Some of them are very directly patient contact related. For example, we have specialties like haematology, microbiology and infection, where people may be involved in face-to-face -face clinics with patients and directly see them on a day-to-day -day patient care basis. Others of our specialties are far less directly patient facing. So for example, some may be very laboratory based where people rarely see patients in a face-to-face -face situation. For example, histopathology. However, all our specialties are vital to patient care. You could not have healthcare without pathology. So we are a fantastic specialty within medicine as a whole. What this means is that there are a whole range of specialties within pathology and there's something to suit everybody. Because of the wide range of specialties we, co we cover, there is something for everyone. And even within each specialty, there are a huge range of opportunities within pathology. Those opportunities range from healthcare on a patient to patient and case to case basis to other things like research and teaching. For example, research is an area where pathologists are always in demand, whatever specialty of pathology they belong to. Virtually no research can be undertaken without pathology input because it is so key to patient care and to interpreting the data and to interpreting the way that the research is designed and structured and run. So if you'd like to pursue an academic career, there will be opportunities for you. But similarly, if you are working as a pathologist doing diagnostic work, there are a whole range of research opportunities that will be open from a project to project basis for you. Similarly, in teaching, because pathology underpins all of healthcare, there are opportunities in a wide range of teaching, for, from teaching medical students to medical postgraduates of all medical specialties, but also to teaching allied healthcare professionals as well, be they nurses, mortuary staff, or people more loosely affiliated with healthcare who need to have interactions and teaching. I personally have been involved in teaching all of these groups and including teaching the police and the military. So if teaching and training are areas of specific interest to you, then there are a large number of opportunities in pathology, whichever specialty you pursue. The result of this range of specialties and the range of opportunities is that you can develop a career that really suits you and which allows you to do the things that you are interested in. In addition, because pathology is so wide ranging, there are lots of job opportunities in pathology. Job opportunities virtually anywhere within the United Kingdom or indeed around the world. And that means people can work where it's most convenient for them. Pathology is also very family friendly. This means that it fits well with your work life balance and gives opportunities for people to pursue their interests outside of work which leads to a much better work-life balance. Pathology is very flexible, and this is becoming more so due to technology developments. This means people are more able to work from home and more able to work flexibly, which again improves work-life balance. In terms of the Royal College of Pathologists, we were formed 60 years ago, and, the, and we are here to support all our pathology specialties. This means that whatever specialty you are in, the college is there to support you, to help you and to advocate for you so that you have the support and resources that you need to be able to provide the healthcare that you wish to for your patients.
For trainees of the college, there are many things. And we have a very active trainee committee who feed into many of the activities of the college, giving us a trainee perspective, making sure that, that, that colleagues never lose sight of the role of trainees and the importance of trainees as the next generation of consultants. We have a website that offers a whole range of resources specifically for trainees. And we also have a pathology portal, which is a superb online vehicle for learning for trainees and for others. In addition to this, we run webinars, teaching sessions and other events. So there are a whole range of things that the college offers specifically for training and trainees. But beyond that, the college is there to support the profession particularly in terms of raising the profile of the profession nationally and internationally, and ensuring that the profession has the resources it needs to be able to provide the service it needs and wants to provide to its patients, particularly around things like workforce. Pathology is a fantastic career. It offers a whole range of opportunities and there is something for everyone. We welcome everybody at the Royal College of Pathologists who is a pathologist and who works in pathology. And we are keen to support anyone who is interested in a job in pathology and our trainees are a valuable resource to us in the college. We will work hard with you and to support you and to help you develop a career in pathology. I would like to welcome you today to the Trainee Day and I look forward to meeting you in the future. Thank you. My name is Jo Brinklow um, and I'm Director of Learning at the Royal College of Pathologists. Um, my um, role at the college is to oversee um, the training, examinations, assessment and also the international activities of the college. Um, so what we thought we'd do today is just give a brief outline of what the college does, but also um, really importantly, how we interact with lots of other organisations and institutions that um, you've probably already come across and you will come across during the course of your postgraduate training. So welcome to your college. Um, it's um, really important that um, you come away from today with a really good understanding of what we can do for you during the course, not just of your training, but then as you progress into becoming a consultant, um, the college does um, an enormous amount of work um, to support all of our specialties um, but today I'm just going to concentrate mainly on training because obviously that's important to you right now. So um, the college is a national college um, and we provide we have um, training committees and also specialty advisory committees for all of our pathology specialties, um, 17 of them. Um, but as you know, and you've heard from Adrian already, we have a chemical pathology training committee and also an, an SAC as well. Um, we develop curricula and assessment systems for the medical pathology specialties and also we provide curricula for the HSST trainees, um, the clinical scientists completing their training as well, and also develop and run uh, examinations twice a year. Um, we also have a role in providing um, ePortfolio, the LEP system, and you'll hear from Michael a little bit later on about that. Um, and you'll, all, if you've had a look at the college website already, you'll see that there is ARCP guidance. Um, we also have a relatively new pathology portal, which has been developed in conjunction with what was Health Education England, now NHS England, um, providing um, lots of information, learning, training um, across the pathology specialties, um, still in development, but, but going well. You can also access lots of advice and guidance throughout training. One of the things that we do realise is it can sometimes be a bit confusing about who to approach um, for things. Is it the college? Is it the deanery? Um, but my advice is, you know, if if in doubt, come to the college. And even if we can't help you, we probably know who will be able to help you and we'll be able to put you in the right direction. Um, and um, we also oversee applications to the specialist register for our trainees that's obviously the certificate of completion of training and that might seem a long way away now but it goes really quickly so um, in no time at all hopefully you'll be coming to us about that 
Um, the college also has a very active trainee advisory committee. So um, we have a range of trainees from all specialties, um, all backgrounds um, who come together twice a year um, to discuss all of the issues that are relevant to, to trainees in general, but also pathology trainees and myself, the clinical director of um, examinations, the clinical director of training and assessment, the president, the vice president for learning, we all go along um, and answer questions. And prior to those meetings, um, you should get an email from the college asking if you have any questions, any concerns, any issues, anything like that. And then we answer all of those in the meeting and then they're fed back. Um, as I said, we're a four nation college and we also have a regional structure. So there is um, there is a college council, but there are also um, co uh, councils for the devolved nations. And then in England, there are representatives um, across the country as well. And they hold regular surgeries, meeting with any trainees and members um, that want to talk to them about any concerns that they may have. Um, and we also have a range of members providing um, external input into deaneries and letbies as well. And as I said, um, I, I oversee the international activities of the college. And one of the other things that we do at the college is to provide support to international medical graduates with GMC uh, to, in order to obtain GMC registration, either through sponsorship or MTI. So just going to break off slightly, but I did just want to um, highlight to everybody that the college offers the Totem Pro card um, as a benefit of registering with the college as a trainee. Uh, and this does give um, a wide range of discounts for a number of retailers. Um, it's really a handy little card um, and you can, uh, it's, a, it's a small fee, but you can buy it for either one, two or, or three years and you can keep renewing that during during your training. If you haven't seen it already, um, there is some information on the website, but you can also just email the training team and I've got all the email addresses at the end um, if you're interested in getting one of those. Okay, so I've talked quite a lot about what the college does to support um, our, our doctors in training, um, but the college also does a wide range of other activities. Um, and some of these you'll, you'll probably hear about during the course of your training. And the first one you may have been involved with already. So we provide support for undergraduates and foundation doctors. It's really important to us to make sure that we do everything we can to get doctors interested or potential doctors interested in pathology as a career um, so there are lots of activities that go on in order to promote that you might have been to our annual summer school which is every August um, there are essay competitions and lots of different things going on um, one of the other really big areas of activity is around workforce and we've just changed our approach to how we gather evidence about workforce and we're going to be doing, well we are doing national surveys now and the first set of results for the first national survey are about to be published in the next few months. Um, but this is really important because one of the other things that the college does is lobby government um, about um, what's required in order to run the pathology services and that's across all of our specialties um, and there are lots of meetings going on all the time um, the president and other senior officers at the college um, making sure that they're getting the message across about where we have shortages um, and where more needs to be done to support the workforce. There's a range of other things there that you can see that I've sort of bullet pointed. So I'm not going to, to go through all of them, but it was just really to give you an idea um, about the range of things that go on in the college every day um, and some perhaps give you some ideas about some other things that, that you might want to have a look at. Um, I've mentioned the pathology portal already. Again, this is something for you to have a look at uh, after this meeting. Um, this is um, a, an online learning platform that has been set up by one of our previous presidents, Professor Joe Martin, as I said, in conjunction with NHS England. Um, it's 
been around for about a year now um, and some specialties have more content on there than others but the idea is is that the portal will develop a huge range of content for across all of the specialties um, so um, it's hosted on the learning hub the NHS England learning hub you might already be registered to that um, but if not it's really simple to uh, register for access and go and take a look also, you might have noticed already that you have your own section on the college website. There's lots of information on there, again, to support you, um, your curricula, um, information about your assessments, information about the examinations, um, all sorts of things that should take you right the way through the course of your training. So I mentioned earlier on that we work with a range of organisations and across a range of organisations in terms of um, delivery of training. So as I mentioned, we publish our curricula and those have to meet GMC standards. Uh, we can't publish any curricula or start any new examinations or make changes to examinations until the GMC have approved them and confirmed that they meet their standards. Um, and then our curricula are... Um, implemented locally by the deaneries um, and then there are also the local education providers as you sort of burrow down deeper into the individual training programs and rotations um, and the college will come into contact with all of those at, at some stage be it through ARCPs, our training committees, for example, have all of the training programme directors from around the country on them. Um, so the college really does span the whole range of the organisations with regard to postgraduate medical training. Um, just a little bit about the GMC. So um, ever since I've been working at the college, we've gone from having really no oversight to being quite heavily regulated by the General Medical Council. And as I've said, they set out a range of standards that we must meet in order to be able to provide you with your curriculum and your examinations, your assessments and so forth. Um, in 2021, we released new curricula across all of our specialties, including chemical pathology. Um, and that was in line with the new Excellence by Design document that you can see on the left hand side of your screen there. Um, included in that was a requirement for the colleges to make sure that we um, implemented the generic professional capabilities framework um, that sets out all of the generic skills of what it is to be a doctor and all colleges had to make sure that they did that. And there were other there were lots of other changes that went along with that as well. Um, and it's not just the colleges that that have the, those expectations to meet. You can see the promoting excellence document on the right hand side. That's more for uh, deaneries um, and statutory education bodies to make sure that when they're implementing curricula and running training programs, again, they're meeting the GMC standards. If you want to take a look at any of those documents, they're all available on the GMC website. Also, just an, a little reminder, and you may have completed this already, um, if you've been in other training programmes or um, even in foundation, but the GMC run a national trainee survey um, and a trainer survey every year. Um, and the results of those are used to look at um, how training is running across specialties, across deaneries, nationally. Um, so it's really important that you just take a, a few minutes to complete that each year. And again, just a little note um, about the role of the deaneries. As I say, we do know that sometimes it can be a little bit unclear about exactly who does what between the college and the deanery. So um, the deaneries are overseen by the four statutory education bodies of the four nations. Um, and as I've said, they, their role really is to um, implement the curricula that the colleges uh, publish um, and to make sure that the, the programmes meet the requirements of those curricula and that there are appropriate quality management processes in place. I think perhaps where it gets a bit more muddy for trainees is it was around the ARCP process. So the, it's the role of the deanery to implement the ARCPs. 
and run those. They're the ones that will give you your date um, and organize it and all of those types of things. But the college also has an input into that in terms of we've implemented the ARCP process in the, the LEP system. Um, and we will pr provide you with the information about the types of evidence that you should be gathering um, in advance of your ARCP. So, okay, um, this is just a little note about who you might need to contact as you're going through your training. Um, you probably will need to contact training um, and assessment most initially, uh, and then as you're going through, you'll, you'll obviously be um, contacting the examinations as you get up to taking the part one. If you've not registered with the college yet, then that's really important to do so. That gives you access to all of the things that you need to support your training, such as the LEP system and other things. So please do that, uh, or you may have done that already. Um, if you have any questions about curriculum, syllabus, ARCP guidance, uh, any training advice, as I've said, even if you know it's not us that can help you, we will be able to find someone that can advise you. So any of those queries can go to the training team, training at rcpath.org. For the LEP system, it's assessment at rcpath.org. Um, and then if you have any questions about the pathology portal, um, really straightforward, pathology portal at rcpath.org. And then when you're getting onto your examinations, if you have any questions about the examinations, then you can contact the exams team on exams at rcpath.org. So I hope that's just been helpful as a really quick oversight. But as I've said, if you've got any questions, you can just pop them in the Q&A box and um, we will answer them as we go along. Thank you. OK, so next we have um, um, Dr. Park, Dr. Adrian Park, who's going to give you an overview of the chemical pathology curriculum. Can I hand over to you, Adrian? OK, well, welcome. Um, and so the aim today is to welcome you and to talk about the curriculum uh, and the assessment requirements uh, and examination requirements. And although um, what we do have later on is more detail about the exams as well. Uh, so what do we want to achieve in your training? Well, we want you to be training you to be consultants who can run a clinical biochemistry laboratory. Uh, is fundamentally what we're aiming to do. Um, but also what we're aiming to do is to train you to be a consultant who can provide outpatient clinics in uh, lipids, diabetes, nutrition, and this is um, uh, obesity and malnutrition, metabolic bone, and adult inborn areas of metabolism. Uh, fundamentally with the latter, aiming to train you uh, on a shared care base, basis with adult inborn areas of metabolism, um, tertiary referral physicians. Um, it is possible to do additional training uh, if you have MRCB to become a fully fledged um, adult inborn areas of metabolism physician. Um, so how do we train you? We use a curriculum. And this curriculum uh, is new from the summer of 2021. Uh, the specialty used to be uh, known as chemical pathology subspecialty metabolic medicine, but now this has been totally renamed as chemical pathology. Uh, and so that is a specialty um, which is currently going to be on your CCT. Um, it is based, the training we're going to give you is based on the shape of training. Uh, and what we aim to do is we should be providing teaching on um, during the job and on the job training to this end. So what you do need to do, is, as Joe's alluded to, is to look at the RCPATH website. There's a lot of information there. Um, so this is um, the curriculum information is, is all on the website. Um, what you will see, um, and I'll just bring up a pointer at this point here. Uh, you will see this is a slightly old side. We've got two curriculum here. It will just say chemical pathology. Uh, for the curriculum under training by specialty and it is this slide uh, you will see this picture still is correct for which you click on um, so uh, what you will get under this is you'll get uh, the chemical pathology curriculum for 2021 from 2021 onwards uh, and this will also have the chemical pathology syllabus as well it will give you information about workplace-based assessments uh, and um, will tell you about the chemical pathology curriculum update. So how do we train you? 
you need to refer to the curriculum and the syllabus on the website. Uh, and we train you using a variety of things. We assess your training as well. Uh, we use assessments. So we use case-based discussions, direct observations of practical skills, evaluation of clinical management events, and min mini clinical evaluation exercises. Uh, the abbreviations here, so for example, case-based discussions are often known as CBDs, uh, direct observation of practical skills, DOPS, and so forth. We also use multi-source feedbacks, and each year you will have an ARCP, an Annual Review of Competence of Progression. Uh, and this is run by your local deanery, uh, and it is checking that actually you are progressing with regards to your um, the curriculum and the syllabus uh, through your training uh, satisfactorily. And if there are problems, it aims to try and address them uh, and provide support for you. And it's your means of actually progressing through training uh, and ultimately uh, a means of signing you off as a consultant uh, at the end of the ARCP process after your fifth year. So curriculum development and assessment. So basically, um, over the past 10 years, there's been a variety of drivers for changing um, how we train our doctors. Uh, there was a shape of training report back in 2013, with, which has led to the GMC in part developing this generic professional capabilities framework back in 2017. Um, so what we're aiming to do is but very much based on the shape of training principles. So we, what we're trying to train you reflects, you know, patient population, service provider needs. Um, you know, this business of being able to provide uh, emergency acute care uh, in, and continuity of care, care in the community, flexible learning, generalism versus specialism, post CCD credentialing. And what you'll find is that thus, in the curriculum, what you will find is that there is a variety of skills which is generic to all uh, training curriculums. And this just means that actually, say, if you wanted to change specialty later on, it is much easier for you to do it. And it would mean that your train, you know, a percentage of your training that you've obtained just transfers across to a new curriculum. And if someone wanted to come into our specialty from uh, a different training program they could also change across with some of the skills that they've learned being you know readily transferable over to uh, our current curriculum and what you'll find is that there are these generic professional capabilities framework based on professional knowledge professional skills professional values and behaviors uh, under professional skills uh, you have um, uh, health promotion and illness prevention leadership and team working patient safety and quality improvement, safeguarding vulnerable groups, education and training, research and scholarship. So with the chemical pathology uh, CCT pathway, this is how it works. So generally speaking, you um, get you qualify and you do foundation training for two years. You then get selected into a core training medical pit, a core training period, and this could be IMT. Um, uh, and you then develop, get a postgraduate qualification. So a number of you will have MRCP, but there are others like uh, MRCP, MRCGP, for example, which are allowed by a curriculum. You then get selected into the specialty, which is where you are now. And um, you are now ST3 to start off with. And this is a five-year training program. And during this time, you'll aim to you will need to pass FRC path part one and part two. At the end of this, where at the final ARCP, you get uh, passed as being appropriate for CCT, and this will get signed off then in due course by the Royal College and, um, uh, and ultimately by the GMC. Uh, and then you can actually start practicing um, as a consultant. During this time, you have work-based based assessments. Um, after CCT, uh, you aim to continue with continuous pro uh, professional development, um, and there is potential scope 
um, which is still very much um, in development of what's called post-CTD credentialing. And this could be relevant, for example, if you wanted to pursue a career in adult inborn errors of metabolism. So capabilities in practice, SIPs. So essentially what we are trying to provide is outcomes-based assessment. So there's a move within postgraduate medical education, medical education towards the assessment of educational outcomes. And the outcomes of a training program are to produce doctors who are able to demonstrate that they are competent across a range of activities. The concept of entrustable professional activities is gaining momentum across the globe as a means of determining whether trainees are ready for unsupervised practice. Capabilities in practice describe professional tasks or work within the scope of a curriculum. SIPs are based on the format of entrustable professional activities and they utilize professional judgment of appropriately trained expert assessors, uh, i.e. your clinical and educational supervisors. SIPs provide a defensible way of forming a global judgment of professional performance. In order to complete training, the doctor must demonstrate that they are capable of unsupervised practice in all SIPs as detailed in the curriculum. Each SIP is further broken down, and you have a series here of descriptors, the expected levels of performance, how the SIP is mapped onto the relevant generic professional capability, the evidence that may be used to inform entrusted decisions. And this is what you will see in the curriculum. Each SIP has a set of descriptors associated with that activity or task. These descriptors indicate the minimum level of knowledge, skills, and attitudes that should be demonstrated. The descriptors are not a comprehensive list, and there are many more examples that would provide equally valid evidence or performance of performance. Here we go. Generic SIPs. Um, there are a number of SIPs which are generic, and these actually hopefully um, demonstrate that you're able to function successfully with NHS organizational and management system, able to deal with ethical and legal issues related to clinical practice, that you communicate effectively and are able to share decision making while maintaining appropriate situational awareness, professional behavior, and professional judgment. But you are focused on patient safety and deliver effective quality improvement in patient care. You're able to carry out research and manage data appropriately. You're able to act as a teacher and a clinical supervisor. With the specialty SIPs, these um, want to demonstrate that you are able to lead a manager laboratory, able to use the laboratory service effectively in the investigation, diagnosis, and management of disease processes. You're able to manage a multidisciplinary team effectively. Uh, you're able to contribute effectively to the management of problems in patients and other specialties. And that you're able to manage patients in an outpatient clinic, inpatient, ambulatory or community setting, including the management of long-term conditions. Assessments. So as I've alluded to before, the ARCP um, is uh, your annual um, review uh, of your training program or your training to date is run by um, your local deanery. And, and basically, it is an assessment of all the other assessments below. For example, any MSS that you've been asked to um, collect um, and of your workplace-based assessments that you've performed. Uh, it is essential that you pass your ALCP um, satisfactorily each year so that you then can um, be signed off at the end of your training. The FRC PATH uh, exams are an important means of assessing your knowledge. Um, and currently they're unchanged for present, um, but changes do remain uh, under review and will be um, uh, discussed with you and communicated to you um, during your training as appropriate. With regards to um, your ARCP, 
Um, one of the things that has come has developed is this business called a tr entrustment levels. Um, and basically, um, it's basically a, a means of trying to show how you develop uh, as a trainee to be from someone with basically no knowledge of how a laboratory works to be able to act unsupervised in a laboratory. And what you can see here is there are four levels of entrustment. So for example, level one is entrusted to observe only, level two, entrusted to act with direct supervision, level three, entrusted to act with indirect supervision, and level four, entrusted to act unsupervised. And again, this will be in the curriculum. So critical progression points. Um, there will be, um, as previously demonstrated, there will be critical progression points, and these will include uh, fundamentally passing the FRC path um, by your final ARCP. As part of your training, you need to use LEPT, and you'll have a demonstration of this later on. This is the learning platform. Um, and the new LEPT platform is available for all trainees now. So it is fundamentally, it was launched back in 2022, and this is what you'll have. You may hear of other trainees speaking about an older platform. You will now be on the new LEPT platform. Um, the ARCP we have discussed, um, with its annual, it uses decision aids uh, to assess adequate progression year by year. And basically, um, the information utilized by the ARCP will be taken from your LEPT, from the LEPT platform. Okay, so it's essential that all your training is logged appropriately on the LEPT platform, as this is um, the means by which you are assessed on an annual on an annual basis, um, and if it isn't, uh, if there's nothing documented on your left, you will not be able to be signed off for adequate progression. It is absolutely essential that all your training experiences and documentation is uploaded to the left in a timely manner. So carrying on, how we train you, we train you with examinations. Um, and you'll have um, part one FRC path and part two FRC path. The part one FRC path um, consists of multiple choice questions and part two has three modules. If you come to the website, you will see uh, under examinations by specialty, a, a link here for clinical biochemistry, um, and it will tell you a the different parts. The first part is for clinical biochemistry part one examination, and it will explain to you about um, the multiple choice questions. There should be a, a demonstration paper there for you to look at as well. For part two, um, there's a part two clinical uh, paper of which there are a couple of modules. So you have paper one, uh, which is an OSPI. Um, and then you have module two, um, which is um, clinical scientific and management skills module, including paper three and the oral examination. More details of the exam will be provided later on. And finally, you have uh, the written component module uh, as module three, which is a dissertation. Um, and this is important to discuss with your train as early on um, in your training, um, as this is still part of the exam. So typically how training should work is that uh, in the first years, um, you need to focus on your clinical biochemistry and acquiring the knowledge for FRC Path Part 1. And you really want to be aiming to take FRC Path Part 1 on completion of your second year of training. During years one to two, um, generally we would advise that you aim to undertake one to two clinics a week. From year three onwards, um, we would advise, uh, we, it, it would be expected that you continue laboratory training with regards to FRC PATH part two. 
If you want to then consider application for a PhD, uh, if that's applicable, uh, and, cons and consider clinical training, consider further clinical training. Post FRC path part two, uh, this is a time where in particular you might, you we would expect you to acquire specialist clinical training um, d depending on what interests you have. So in summary, welcome. I have discussed the curriculum assessments and examinations. Um, and um, uh, it's important that uh, please do register with the college fully and look up the specialty website, um, which should provide you with more information about um, the curriculum, the syllabus, uh, and all the other training requirements that is needed. Please do contact us if you have any questions or concerns we'll aim to help. Um, and we welcome you to the specialty and I hope it all goes well over the coming years. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I've just noticed that we've got um, a question and being as we're just running ahead of time a little bit, I thought maybe we could do that now if that's okay. Um, so the question is, um, what should I do if the whole training is in one hospital and they only run lipid and metabolic, mon uh, metabolic bone clinics? Um, no access to other clinics like obesity and adult inborn error of metabolism. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, I mean, in essence, your um, educational supervisor should, um, this is a question for them, because basically uh, you need to be actually demonstrate that you're trained in the other specialties. Um, so actually you need to contact your educational supervisor about this uh, and um what generally happens is you get rotated elsewhere for a period of time where you can get the necessary experience of those clinics. But it's important to discuss this with, with your educational supervisor really as early as possible, please. Lovely. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, so I think our next speaker is Michael. So Michael's just going to give you uh, some more detail about the LIP system. So I'll hand over to you, Michael. Uh, hi again, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, I hope you can all see that. Uh, just shout if you can't. Um, so as introduced earlier, I'm Michael Gillett, the assessment administrator at the college. One of my roles is to be responsible for all trainee queries regarding the learning environment for pathology trainees, uh, which is known as the LET system. Um, I'm going to give you a demonstration on how to use it, but firstly, I'll just give you a little background uh, into what it is. Um, I know Dr. Park um, just spoke about it. Um, the LEP system is the e-portfolio that trainees uh, used to record all of their progress throughout their years of training. It's used for recording the workplace-based assessments, including the multi-source feedback assessments known as MSFs. Uh, and the system has a functionality to support the annual review of competence progression to so the ARCP process and also provides the educational supervisor's structured report uh, known as the ESSR which is a document that gives a snapshot of one year's worth of training. Um, as I said, I'm going to give you a brief uh, demonstration now, uh, but do note there's uh, some more in-depth instructional videos, uh, which I will show you how to access these uh, shortly. Um, so it's really worthwhile giving them a watch. Uh, so to log in to the LEP system, uh, you're going to access the college homepage, uh, which, as you can see, is rcpath.org. And then straight uh, from this page, from the popular resources menu, just click into the new LEP system. Uh, as Dr. Park alluded to, um, there is the old system at the moment as well. You guys don't need to worry about that. And um, actually, very soon, um, this will just become LEP system on the homepage uh, because the old LEP system um, will, will no longer be there. So you're going to click into the new LEP system. 
and uh, you'll then need to enter your registered email address along with your college password. You should now have uh, been sent an email asking you to set this up uh, if you have uh, completed your registration process. Um, so this is where you can enter your uh, login details. So log in here, uh, we're just going to use uh, a dummy record um, for the purpose of this demonstration. Okay, um, I do really apologise. Um, I'm not sure what's happened here. Um, I'm probably going to have to get on to the, uh, the developers and find out uh, what's happened here. Uh, it was working prior to this meeting. Uh, I was using it and going through this. So um, if I just hand back to you, Joe, and um, I'll, I'll try and make sure that um, I can continue this uh, a, a bit later on. Sure, that's no problem, Michael. We'll um, just swap the um, swap the order around a little bit while you just find out what the issue is. Um, so next on our agenda is... Um, uh, Dr. Kevin Deans, who you've been introduced to already, um, and some of the leads for the part two examination. So if I can hand over to you. Okay, thanks very much. I'm not sure if we've got my uh, colleagues, uh, Craig and Brian, on the call yet, but hopefully by the time we get to their point, they'll be here. Um, I shall, uh, I, I'm, I'm due to start off anyway. So let me just share my screen and uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, exams. Hopefully you're now seeing that uh, in slideshow mode. Um, so FRC path exams. Um, from talking to trainees, they're often something that understandably causes quite a bit of angst, even sometimes before people uh, come into the specialty. Um, I've known trainees to say, look, we've heard about how difficult the FRC path exams are and they actually put us off or made us... Uh, uh, think twice about whether uh, we wanted to come into clinical biochemistry. And obviously, we, we don't want people to be put off of coming into the specialty. Um, the exams are uh, testing, obviously. They do uh, assess uh, whether you are ready to progress in training or by the end of FRC path to, uh, to, to uh, get towards completion of training. But uh, we don't want them to be something that puts people off of coming into the specialty, and they're certainly um, they they shouldn't be you know, disproportionately onerous. They're essentially assessing um, your how how are your knowledge and skills in relation to where you where you should be uh, for that point in training. And importantly, we want to tell you as much as possible about what to expect in the exams. There shouldn't be any surprises or mysteries about them, and we're aiming to get as much information up on the website as we can. Um, so if you were to go onto the website, you would see that uh, uh, in the examination section, it talks about how the FRC path in clinical biochemistry is the appropriate professional qualification for medical trainees progressing to CCT in chemical pathology. Clinical scientists sit the same exam. Um, so there's there's only a very small part where in the, in the oral, um, there's one question that's different depending on whether you're a medic or a scientist, but um, pretty much they're sitting the, 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 the same exam, uh, whether clinical scientist or medic. And they're testing knowledge, skills and attitudes in relation to the Clinical Biochemistry 2021 curriculum that uh, Adrian has already uh, shown you. So if you want to know what's the body of material, what's the scope of what can be assessed in the exam, that's the answer is, uh, is, is what's in the, in the curriculum. So part one, and again, you've heard this a little bit already, as, as you've heard uh, the sort of overview of the curriculum. The intention is that most people would sit part one in ST4, so your second year of specialty training. You are required to have passed it by the end of ST5. Um, so in terms of critical progression points, there are three in the new curriculum. One is entry to specialty training. Uh, one is completion of training at CCT. And the other one, uh, the, the one that's in the middle, is uh, passing part one uh, by the end of ST5. And if you haven't got the part one by the end of ST5, um, that would be uh, that would be considered to be uh, unsatisfactory progress and would, uh, would lead to an outcome three at ARCP where additional training time is required. 
Um, we're assessing uh, material in terms of all the laboratory-based uh, domains, so you can see them listed there. They're on the uh, RCPATH website. And the part one is assessing knowledge and also application of knowledge. And it's roughly considered that 25% is knowledge of the questions are knowledge-based and 75% are application of knowledge. So how do we do that in the part one? It's a three-hour exam. It's an online exam and it's 125 multiple choice questions in single best answer format. And in good MCQ tradition, you get a STEM with a bit of background information, a lead in that asks the direct question and then five potential answers displayed in alphabetical order. And you've got to pick the single best answer. And so do the maths, obviously 180 minutes, 125 questions, you get just under a minute and a half per question. So um, they're, they're, they're questions that can be answered reasonably quickly. Calculations and formulae can be included, but they've got to be a low level of complexity, level of complexity that could be answered within the time limit for the question. So calculation of sensitivity or specificity or routine clinical calculations such as creatinine clearance. You've got less than a minute and a half to do it, so we can't expect you to be doing anything too onerous in that time. And as I say, that exam uh, moved to being delivered online in the earlier stages of the pandemic, and uh, the intention is that that will stay online. So just to give you an idea, and again, uh, as Adrian mentioned, there is an entire uh, specimen paper, I think it's actually uh, previously used questions that have now been retired, up on the website, and our intention is to get as much specimen and past material as possible up on the website, because we don't want there to be surprises in terms of degree of difficulty or the scope of what uh, we're asking you about. We want to be as upfront with you as possible about that. So there's just a typical question that I picked uh, uh, off the website last night. So investigation of the aldosterone renin ratio for uh, detecting primary hyperaldosteronism can be affected by many antihypertensive drugs. That's your STEM. And then it says, so what effect do angiotensin 2 receptor blockers have on aldosterone and renin and the aldosterone renin ratio? And don't worry if you're sitting there thinking, no, I'm not quite sure, but maybe you're thinking, all right, I could work this out, actually. You know, angiotensin receptor blockers so are bound to have a, 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 an impact in reducing aldosterone and the renin will be disproportionately high. And so there's going to be a reduced aldosterone, and increased renin, and therefore the aldosterone steroid to renin ratio will be reduced and you think oh quite fancy answer b in that case and if you picked option b you'd be right so that that's an actual question that's been up there some are more complex than that some are less complex than that um, but the idea is that these are your sort of uh, uh, tests of knowledge and application of knowledge um, and that of the level that you would be expecting that you'd be able to uh, pass uh, usually within your, your uh, second year of training and certainly by the end of your third year, you would have to have. So that's the that's the part uh, one and our colleague Ian Godber uh, leads in organising that one. Then we've got part two and what I'm going to do is present to you part two as it stands at the moment. There are various uh, stages of, uh, of discussion about some changes that might be made to the exam. Uh, and you might hear a little bit of that uh, uh, in, in sort of uh, informal chat with colleagues. But my advice is assume that the exam as it stands at the moment is the exam you're going to have to sit. If there are any changes made to that, we will give uh, you know plenty of notice about that, but assume that the exam as it stands is the exam that you're going to sit. There's three modules. Um, module one is sort of practical skills. It splits into two papers. So there's an OSPI objective structured uh, practical exam uh, that sat in the morning. And uh, there's a, a, a written practical exam that uh, right on time, Craig Webster has come online and is going to talk us through just in a minute. So I'll just talk about OSPI and then I'll hand over to Craig to talk about the, the wet practical. The OSPI is a three hour exam. This is still done face to face. So you come to the exam centre, uh, wh wherever wherever that is. It's, it, it's, it's, it's usually in London. It's in London, certainly in the current sitting. And again, we'll try to give uh, plenty of notice about where and when uh, the exam is. It's a three hour exam. There are 19 questions. It used to be that you actually, a, a bell rang every nine minutes and you moved round to the next station and the next station and the next station. Um, we've actually simplified that a bit now. So you're just sitting down at a desk 
desk with your 19 questions. It still averages out at about nine minutes per question plus nine minutes rest station because the timings haven't changed. Um, but the time is yours to control as you see fit. So you've got you basically got the three hours to get through the 19 questions and you kind of have to pace yourself about that. And some of us reading sort of uh, lab analytical output. So here's a Capillary electrophoresis uh, output. Can you interpret that? Here's some 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 questions around that. Clinical scenarios, investigation protocols. Um, here's an internal quality control uh, uh, chart uh, and ask some questions around that, or some external quality assessment returns. And I'm conscious that some of these terms um, you, you you might be thinking at the moment, what, what's he talking about? But you won't be thinking that by the time you come to sit, sit it, because this will be the sort of stuff you'll have you'll have trained in. And there's one question that tests communication skills uh, in, in terms of it's, it's a written communication skills. So it might be something has gone wrong and you have to write uh, you know a letter of explanation and apology to a clinician or uh, your IT systems down and you have to write uh, uh, a, a brief outline of uh, procedures for uh, uh, contingencies for that, that sort of thing. So 19 questions, three hours, and it's testing your sort of um, ability to uh, interpret lab data and various issues around that. So that's your morning. And then that same day, uh, module two, you set the practical in the, oh, I'll show you an example first, and then I'll tell you about the practical. I keep thinking I'm introducing Craig, and I'm not. <laughs> well, here's here's an example again. It's up on the website. Um, there are there are some examples of past questions there. Um, so a bit of blurb there about a patient where there's some uh, question about whether the alcohol result that you've reported uh, from your automated analyzer is is accurate. The clinician says it doesn't fit with what I'm expecting clinically. And so you agree to do it by gas chromatography. And so they give you some traces and don't be horrified by this because your training from now until you sit this will tell you all about how to do these sort of things. But here's a gas chromatography trace and some peak areas and peak heights there. And uh, the data will all be there to allow you to do calculations but, but that by that stage, you'll be well trained in how to do to work out what is the alcohol concentration? So that sort of thing, basically. And again, it has to be stuff that's doable within about that nine minute or thereabouts sort of time that you've got for one of these questions. So that was an actual one that was used in an exam recently. It's up on the website now uh, as an example. And then you, so you do your calculations, you look at the quality control sample, is that acceptable? Can you report the results? And is there any difference between the two measures? And, and usually the trick with these, I mean, obviously there is there are things to prepare and, and uh, you'll be taken through that in your training. The other thing is that all the data to answer the question should be there in the question. And so sometimes it's just keeping the head when, you, when you're presented with a load of data and thinking, all right, these are the bits of information that I require and then doing a calculation around it. But fear not, that'll look much less daunting when you come to the point of actually uh, sitting it. And the point of your training is to uh, have you trained up to be able to address uh, uh, sort of analytical questions like that. Now, having having really uh, bigged up the introduction to Craig there, let me uh, let, let me welcome uh, Dr. Craig Webster, who has uh, uh, particular responsibility around the practical. So, uh, Craig, over to yourself to talk a bit about what that involves. Do you want me to stop sharing? Do you have a, do you have slides to share, Craig? We can't hear you either, mind you. <laughs> you don't look like you're muted, but we can't hear you, which worries me slightly. You might want to check which mic input selected on Zoom. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, that's better. Do you want me to unshare? Are you are you got stuff to share? Except you're muted again. <laughs> Okay, what about now? I'll keep That's my better. The unmute thing. That's better. Right, am I stopping sharing? Have you got yes, slides? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, all right, grand, grand. There we go. Right, over to yourself. The people now. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm responsible for the uh, practical exam. And I guess the, the big change from the practical exam, which is on the website, is you are unlikely, I think, un never going to have to come to Nottingham and put a lab coat on. Mm -hmm and start to pipette out samples and, and that kind of stuff. Because what we want to try and do is make the practical exam more appropriate for your daily working lives. And I don't think doing an alkaline phosphatase test by hand kind of represents that these days. So that part of the practical has gone. What you will see is a one paper of three hours long, 
possibly usually it's split up into three parts where you do something like an experimental design results interpretation and then maybe some maybe some practical elements like doing a calculation interpreting an eqa report those kind of things so that's where we're aiming for for the practical exam the biggest tip i can give you for the practical exam and for what kevin just went through on the OSPE exam is to go into the lab and don't neglect the laboratory go into the laboratory see what the biomedical scientists are doing the clinical scientists follow them around day-to-day -day basis you'll get a complete feel for what actually goes on in the laboratory and what the practical elements are. And that'll put you in good stead for um, doing really well on the practical exam to some extent, because it's the job that you do in a laboratory. It's possibly one of the easier parts. The exam, I hesitate to say that, but it's one of the exams that if you put the legwork in the laboratory, you should do really well. And so it's just the things that you will see on a day-to-day -day basis in the lab. So that's all I can really say about the practical it's just your day-to-day -day job in the laboratory and as you go through your training, you should pick it up. Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, I mean, as Craig says, we, we one of the things we're really trying to do is make the whole exam uh, as relevant to the day job as possible. So, um, you know, sometimes you find that if, if we... There can be a tendency for the exam to reflect how things used to be, you know, at various points in the past, and we don't want to do that. We, we need to test what's your ability to do the day job today. So, um, yeah, as Craig says, get involved in the work of the lab. If there's method verifications going on, method comparisons going on, that sort of stuff, see how that's done, because that's the sort of thing that we are likely to give, you know, if so, you know, clinician contacts you and says uh, uh, I'd like to start using this point of care meter um, what are the things that need to be done in assessing if that point of care meter is fit for practice or you're about to change analytical equipment, change analyzers, change methods, compare your new one with your old one, how's that done, how do you make sense of the data, that's the sort of thing that we'll do, we'll present you with a sort of uh, laboratory problem, maybe you have to design you know some some experiments that would, would then be uh, in theory carried out you're not actually going to carry them out because you're sitting down at a desk writing your answers and what we mark is what you write um, but uh, uh, you're designing some experiments and then we might present you with some some lab data and you have to go through all these so right okay here's a method comparison what graphs do I plot what you know uh, what calculations do I do to make sense of uh, whether this uh, analysis is fit for purpose and whether uh, there's uh, wh wh whether there are any implications uh, clinically and then sometimes we do a bit about then communicating that to clinicians and so on and, and, and you're writing a little you know he, uh, let's imagine you're going to change your method for a hormone analysis or something you've done all your work up you've done all your analysis and then you write a sort of letter to a known lab specialist saying here are the key issues you need to know about these are the sort of things that we tend to we, we, we tend to put in there and again, we want to get some examples up there on the website, um, just to kind of, uh, uh, just just so there are no surprises about that. I think, um, uh, sorry, Kevin. The, the other thing is probably the annual uh, UCAS assessment is an ideal opportunity to get involved in that, and you'll see uh, again those are the type of questions we might ask. A UCAS inspector has found a problem in this method or this procedure. What what would you do to correct it? How would you communicate that change? And how would you document the change to maintain your accreditation status? So about the the sort of legal aspects of running laboratory services as well. So and they'll happen every year. So I'm guaranteed there'll be plenty of opportunities to get involved in that in the lab. Yeah. Essentially what we want to test is you know once once you're a consultant and somebody from the lab comes to you and says, I've done this method work up, I've done this comparison or whatever, um, and they present you with all the output that you can make sense of it and draw sensible clinical conclusions about is this is this appropriate uh, for, to, to go ahead and, and make the, the, the method change because you're you're not as a consultant uh, chemical pathologist going to be standing in the, the lab with a white coat on as Craig says actually doing the analysis but you are going to have to understand what's been done so that you can make sense of the output really and that's the practical really yeah um, so that's your yep. part two module one um, so OSPE and practical all of which is now written, but it is an in-person on-site exam. And then you have uh, part two, module two. It's possible to sit both in the same sitting, I'd say, unless you're against the clock, think long and hard about sitting the two in the same sitting because it's a lot to prepare for. If possible, I think spread them out. Uh, so do your part two, module one. So that's your, your OSPE and practical in, in, in one sitting. And then maybe plan that once you've passed that, you'll come and do the part two, module two. Um, part two, module two, 
involves uh, uh, two bits to it. There's a written three-hour paper um, and there's an oral, and which order you have the two in uh, just depends on you know wh how the scheduling goes because we run orals all day and half of the half the cohort are getting the oral in one half of the day and half are sitting the written paper and uh, you know you, you you'll do one in one half of the day and one in the other half of the day. So again, it's a physical on-site exam. So the written paper involves two uh, journal questions, sort of what we call critical appraisal and six clinical cases. And Dr. Brian Shine is here, and Brian um, uh, has particular involvement in, uh, amongst other things, the uh, journal questions, critical appraisal. Um, so Brian, do you want to talk us through that? Well, what I managed to do is, <laughs> can you hear me? First, okay, good. Yes, we can. <laughs> what what I what I managed to do is to minimise the uh, the thing. So let let me tell you. I'm sorry, I've got some stuff going on in the background. That was good. Um, so let let me show you a paper that we've recently used, um, and I need to share. How do I share? Share screen. Here we go. And what I want is this. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Yep, that's good. All right. So this was a paper in. Um, science, and what what you'll see is that it's it's really quite a general paper. So it claims that um, you you can th this group of tests that this 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 uh, lot of people have invented or have developed uh, enables them to screen for lots of tests. So all cancers, ovary, liver, stomach, pancreas, esophagus, and so on. It's the best thing that's ever been invented. It's an amazing test. Um, it has great sensitivity and specificity. And, and really, you, you know, your, your hospital should adopt it immediately, is, is their message. Um, and it's better than anything that's ever come before. So, um, You've probably seen quite a lot of this. Uh, I mean, what this bit of the paper is designed to test is is really, you know, how do you look at a paper? How do you decide that what what the claims are? How do you decide how good the claims are and, and what the evidence is for it? So the kinds of questions that we can ask about this, let me share... Um, so share, and I'm going to share that. So this is our, the, these are the, um, so let me zoom that. Okay, can you see that? All right, so our first question might be, write a short news article, for instance, about this paper. Uh, no more than 300 words. Um, uh, but we might also ask for a scientific summary or something like that. And, and we'll have thought about what the key points are. So, you know, you need an introduction, what the article's about, uh, where it was carried out. And, and this was the team at Johns Hopkins University in, in Baltimore. And uh, what the test promises, how it works, and what their study was. So, so an introduction. And then... You, we might ask you something about to summarize the advantages and disadvantages. By the way, each of these questions has 20 marks. So just under half the marks go for that. Uh, then four marks for summarizing the advantages and disadvantages of this combined mutational and biomarker screening test. Uh, what you might want, so this is more speculative, uh, it might be mentioned in the paper, but you might have to work it out for yourselves. What what you might want to do in the future to to verify what the, the claims of this paper, and then we might ask you to do a calculation. Um, and you you know 
if you had a cohort of 50,000 people and the sensitivity was 82% and the specificity was 99%, um, that's to say that the sensitivity, for those who may not yet know, uh, is the proportion of people who have the condition that you're interested in, who have a positive test, and the specificity is the proportion of people who don't have the condition that you're interested in, who have a negative test. So, and you can usually do these things by, by constructing your own two by two table and giving them what the sensitivity and specificity are. And then we can come out with um, that most people would have a negative test, uh, but 493 people would have a positive test result and might be subject to unnecessary invasive tests and anxiety. And 126 of the patients, so we calculated that around 700 people would have the condition, uh, but of those, around a quarter are going to have a negative test. Or no, uh, so... Well, about 20%, sorry, will have a negative test. So so actually, that's could be quite a problem, depending on how important you, it is for you to, to do that. So that, those are the sorts of things that we might want you to uh, discuss. So those are the critical appraisal papers. Uh, Kevin, are you going to talk about the clinical cases and then and then about yes. the bio itself? Yes, yes. So yes. That, okay. Got some right. stuff there. Feel feel free as well to pitch in now because yeah, uh, yeah. uh, Brian you. obviously is hi highly involved in, in oral examination as well. Um, so so yes, yeah, so critical appraisal again. We try to again the ethos is very much testing your uh, readiness for the day job. So uh, rather than uh, essentially looking for some you know. Uh, obscure statistical howler in a paper, we are more likely to be asking, can you make sense of the paper? Is the paper applicable to the scenario that you're being presented with? So clinician wants to implement whatever test can, you know, is this, does this paper, is it applicable to that? Does it show evidence that supports or doesn't support the introduction of it? And what steps would you have to take to uh, take that forward? And, and often is again, can you take the data in the paper and then communicate it to a non-lab specialist audience uh, in some way. So these are the sort of things we're testing. So I'm just going to re-screen share again here, and uh, we're going to uh, go on to talk about the clinical cases and the Viva. Um, so here we go, screen share. Let's do that. Um, the uh, paper that's got uh, journal articles uh, has also got clinical cases. Um, it's a three-hour paper. It's a written. Um, so your journal articles, um, the recommendation is that you spend uh, about two hours on those two journal articles um, and then one hour on the six clinical cases. But actually, the journal articles count 50% of that paper and the clinical cases count 50% of that paper. How you allocate your time's up to you. So that's just a guide. Six clinical cases. Again, we're looking at the sort of things that we would expect you to be able to uh, handle uh, as, a, 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 as, as a consultant uh, biochemist. So um, here's one that's up on the website. There's a whole past paper up there. This is one from what was last autumn, wasn't it? And we've, we've published that paper now. We won't obviously use these questions in their exact form uh, again, but uh, the, the subject material is very much uh, uh, fair game. So uh, one of the six questions, so you're presented with a clinical scenario, a 43-year-old uh, man uh, brought into hospital, found unconscious at home, given a set of blood gases there. Can you classify this patient's acid-base status? So hopefully there's a, a nice uh, a, a nice easy four marks to uh, yeah, start things off with and make sure you get all four marks. Don't just say they've got metabolic acidosis. Say metabolic acidosis with partial respiratory compensation, four marks in the bag, bang. And, that, and each question's out of 20 again, basically. And then we reveal a little bit more and, and say, okay, here's some results. Can you calculate an osmolal gap? Can you calculate an anion gap? And again, you just put down, show you're working, uh, do your calculation, 
and the marks are yours. And then can you make sense of them? What two additional tests are needed? Um, people like this question. This, this, this question was, people scored very highly on this, on, on this question. So could they correctly identify that it would be good to measure an ethylene glycol and a methanol? And then a little bit of a tricky final four marks that you either know or you don't know because you've either seen it or you haven't seen it, where one of the metabolites of ethylene glycol um, causes an interference on the method for lactate that's used on a gas analyzer, but not the lab method. Um, you've either seen that or you haven't, but that's just the four marks icing on the cake at the end, basically. Um, you can pass the question without uh, without knowing that, basically. Um, so... Uh, yeah, six questions like that. So again, we try to avoid it. we try to avoid anything that's esoteric just for the sake of being esoteric. We try to focus on the things that we really would expect you to, uh, you know, be solid on. So, can you make sense of an unexplained metabolic acidosis and guide the clinician about appropriate further tests? Ditto for hyperaminemia, for uh, hypoglycemia, for hyponatremia, for uh, hypokalemia, etc. You know, these sort of key uh, bread and butter things. Um, so a, a consultant level would be the ones that might get passed to you. And, and I, I, I don't know how it, it works where, where you are, but sometimes I'll find that the duty biochemist might come to me and say, right, I've, I've had a call about this, I've gone through a few things. But I think there might be something else going on. We have a chat and they'll come and, and, and ask you about that. So think of those sort of scenarios. So six clinical cases. So that's so six clinical cases, two journal papers. That's your three hour written paper in part two, module two. And then the other part of part two, module two is the oral exam. Um, so that's done you know, the same day. So you might sit the written paper in the morning, do the oral in the afternoon, or you might be in the group that's the other, the other way around, does the oral in the morning and then the written paper in the afternoon. And the oral exam we recognize is is a stressful experience because you're obviously sitting there with two examiners. Um, you, you meet two pairs of examiners in the course of the exams. You get two examiners for the first bit and then you go on to another uh, pair of examiners. And it's stressful. Um, and we try to put you at ease as much as possible because we're not there to make this any more stressful than the situation uh, actually is already. And again, we're, we're testing are you ready you know to this is essentially now the last check as far as frc as far as far as exams are concerned before you potentially head for cct obviously you can't cct without the frc path you need the frc path so are, are you ready are you there basically so the first set of two questions you get 30 minutes beforehand to prepare your your thoughts so you get given out some written material uh, one of those questions is a management type scenario and one of them is a clinical scenario for medical candidates and for scientific candidates. We give an analytical scenario. That's about the only part in the whole exam where medics and scientists have something that's, that's, that's slightly different. So you get 30 minutes to sit down, jot down some notes, prepare your thoughts, and then you go into your first pair of examiners and uh, you'll spend 10 minutes sort of chatting about the management question and then 10 minutes chatting about the clinical uh, question. And then after those 20 minutes, you're out and whisked swiftly into the next pair of examiners. Um, so you're getting a fresh start after that. So if your first set of questions, if you think, oh, I don't think that went well, don't worry, you've got a fresh start with a fresh pair of examiners. If you're thinking, yeah, that went great, well, you've still got a fresh start with a fresh pair of examiners. Next pair of examiners, you don't, for the second set of questions, have any prep time. So you've not seen the questions before. You're literally going in the, in, in the room cold, if you like. And there are four questions, so about five minutes minutes for each of those four uh, questions. There's one on lab safety, there's one on clinical safety, and there's two further clinical scenarios. And so you've got about five minutes to discuss each, each of those. And again, we're going to relate these very much to the day job. So, you know, here's, here's, these are up on the website. Again, you can go and see these and, and some other ones besides. This was one of the uh, questions that you had the half hour prep time to prepare this and your clinical question before you go into your first pair of examiners. So the story here is that your uh, lab block has been entirely burnt down, destroyed by fire at 11 p.m. on a Friday evening. Um, and you're the on-call consultant. Uh, what do you do? And obviously that's that's actually quite a good test, although it's a hypothetical one, one that we hope you never face, okay? But if you do, you've got to be ready to face it and you've got to be ready to, to tackle it and you've got to be able to think, okay, what would I do immediately? What do I need to do immediately to make sure, to ensure that this, the immediate safety of the situation? What do I do in the short term? What do I do in the medium term? What do I do in the long term? And 
good candidates have got an organised approach. Any incident management question, they think, what do I do immediately? What do I need to do then in terms of corrective type action? What do I do need to do later in terms of preventive type action that shows that you've got a logical framework that shows that you're not going to fill out the data before you call the fire brigade or something like that? Um, you know, that you've got a safe, sensible. I mean, I, I mean, I think for the fiver, I think we want to know that you're safe, you're sensible and you're legal. And that's what we want to know, um, really. So, uh, you know, think think around those sort of, uh, the, the, those sort of uh, domains. So 10 minutes to have a chat through that situation. Time goes quickly. There's a lot to cover in that. And if you've used your prep time wisely, you've got a lot there. And actually, if you're on if you're on topic, um, you know, just keep talking and the examiners will love you. As long as you're on topic, they'll pull you in if you're waffling. Um, Organise your thoughts and signpost to the examiner that you're organising your thoughts. So say, right, I'd like to talk about the immediate action I take, then the medium, then the long term action. They can see that you're organised. Then the other question that we had in that same five, and again, this is from the autumn sitting last year. Um, so again, you've got quarter of an hour, well, 30 minutes for a few questions to prepare your thoughts beforehand. Um, and it was the sort of one that you want to be absolutely ready to deal with. Um, you're, you're called on call um, by the biomedical scientist. Um, they've got a sick neonate with an extremely high ammonia, a real case. Um, and uh, uh, what do you do basically? And it's it's testing out. Can you recognise that hyperammonemia is a clinical emergency? Can you make sure that the clinicians understand that it's an emergency and understand what to do? And can you direct them within the realms of your the limits of your competence? So a lot of that will be saying, right, you need you know you need an urgent repeat. Here's the further test you need to do. You need to get to the phone on the phone to the the national or regional or whatever, wherever you are, whatever the setup is, metabolic uh, uh, consultant immediately to get specialist advice and maybe having a bit of knowledge about what that advice is likely to involve but not not going beyond your own your own areas of competence that's that's the sort of things that we're, we're looking for again um, is this person safe are they sensible and are they legal that's what that's what i'm looking for uh when i'm when i'm examining in in the viva um I'll just chat a little bit, unless I, I'm conscious, uh, certainly Brian, you've, you've, you examine in, in, in Viva, I'm not sure, Craig, Craig if, uh, if you do, but if either of you have any comments on, on the Viva, jump in, otherwise I'll just talk briefly about the project. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll plug on. Mean, I mean, no. Sorry, okay, I'll, 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 all right, grand. I shall plug on. Part two, module three is the project. Um, so, that is still part of the exam at the moment. Let me just uh, uh, kind of try to be as uh, as transparent with you about where we are at the moment. We we want to remove the project and essentially have the capabilities that that tested um, around the ability to carry out a piece of research type work in the broadest sense of the uh, the, the, the terminology and, and write it up. We want to move that to assessment as part of the workplace-based assessments. But of course, any change to the exam has to be approved by the GMC. And you saw a little bit earlier about the framework for how they oversee uh, training and need satisfaction that if we're going to make changes to the exam, that we are going to appropriately assess uh, trainees' capabilities in some other way. So um, the college is about to reapply to the GMC for approval to remove the project. Originally, we had hoped that by the time the new curriculum came in in 2021, we would have the, uh, that approval, but we're now going back to the GMC to seek that approval. We've got some further uh, you know, detail of how we're going to essentially capture those sort of research capabilities in the workplace-based assessments. Um, but we can't do anything until the GMC approves it. So my advice at the moment to all trainees is assume that the exam as it stands at the moment is the exam you will sit. And that includes assume that you will have to do a project. It may be that that changes by the time you get there, but I don't want to I, I don't want to suggest to anyone that they don't do a project and then that suddenly you're playing catch up if the GMC comes back and says, oh, actually, you need to do this and you need to do that. And um, so assume at the moment you will have to do a project. Um, that can, there's a lot of guidance on the on the website about what that can involve. Um, it can involve anything from uh, uh, a sort of novel piece of research. If you're working in an academic unit, it can involve that. It can involve, often for medical candidates, it can involve uh, some sort of uh, analysis of 
that uses the results that are routinely coming out of the work of the department, or it can evolve, involve sort of evaluating a new test or a new method and uh, looking at the clinical implications of that. It's going to be a substantial enough piece of work. It's going to be a piece of work that you carry out. Often it'll be in collaboration with others, of course. What you do is you put together a fairly brief proposal. There's details on the RCPATH website about how to do this. Uh, it's a fairly brief proposal that you put into to FRC, to, to RCPATH for approval. Usually you do that after you've passed the part one, but you can actually submit it anytime after you've registered for the part one. And then obviously you have to have the project through and approved and accepted by the college. Uh, and you have to have passed all your FRCPATH before you can CCT. So remember that timelines can take quite a while. Things always take longer than you expect. Um, we in the college are working hard to try and turn around proposals and uh, the actual project write-ups faster because we're conscious that uh, you know that, that there can be quite a delay there as we're waiting for uh, examiners to uh, have a look at this. And, and, and they won't always approve things at first pass. Sometimes things will have to go back and uh, we'll ask for amendments to projects. So give yourself plenty of time, start your planning early, have a chat. In the relatively early stages of training, it doesn't need to be this week or next, but in the relatively early stages of training, have a chat about project and what you might consider doing for your project. And yes, we will be as upfront as possible if we get the approval from the GMC to remove the project, we'll be as upfront as possible at timelines and whether that means that you no longer need to do a project, but at the moment, assume that you do. There are some further changes to the exam that we're just at the talking about stages that are likely to be many years away from actually happening because a we have to agree within rc path within all the relevant committees and bodies there before we make any changes and b we have to go to gmc for approval so if you start to hear on the grapevine about further changes that that might be coming um yes we'll we'll share as much as possible at every stage of the the way but at the moment assume that the exam as we have just presented it to you is the exam that you will sit. And that, you'll be pleased to know, is the end of my presentation. I'm certainly fine for sticking around for the Q&A later. I, 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 don't, I don't know how you, whether you want to do do that at the end or, or, or take questions now. I, I, I'm happy either way. I don't know how Craig and Brian are placed. Thanks, Kevin. Um, we don't have any questions at the moment, possibly because that was the most comprehensive exam uh, presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> um, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, if anyone does have any uh, remaining questions, then um, please um, put them in the box. Just to also reiterate, um, as Kevin was talking about you know, other potential changes that might be coming up. The GMC are quite strict that um, we can only really publicize what changes might be once the GMC have agreed them. We fell foul of that once and we won't be doing it again. Um, but what that means is, is that you will get um, lots of notice for an exam change. So, you know, we, we won't be sort of saying, right, this is the new exam change. And then two weeks later, that's the exam that's implemented. So just to put your minds at, at rest there. Okay, now I believe that Michael is back up and running with the LEP system. That's right, yes. Excellent. Yep. Um, okay, so I'm gonna use this as a bit of a live learning uh, opportunity, Michael. So just before you start, can you just explain what the issue was this morning? Um, so it was an issue on the Chrome browser. Um, I emailed the NEP developers uh, immediately um, and the issue appears to have been resolved. Um, it was always working in Microsoft Edge all along, um, but I'm back on Chrome uh, and, and we can just switch over to Edge if, if there is any more problems. Um, but yeah, if, if anything like that did happen uh, when you tried to access the LEP system, uh, you can just uh, contact me um, on assessment at rcpath.org um, and, and we will sort it out uh, this morning. It was just a, an issue with the developers, unfortunately. Okay, so just to reassure everybody, so obviously the LEP system is provided by an external provider. 
um, there are contracts in place. So this type of downtime um, shouldn't and doesn't happen very often. It's just very unfortunate that it happened today and this morning while Michael was about to demonstrate it. On occasion, though, um, we may ask the developers to take the LEP system down or they may need to if we're actually developing the LEP system itself. Um, but normally we will do that sort of out of hours and try and do it at a time when it's, you know, hopefully um, as in, uh, as convenient as, as possible for everybody. And you should get notice from us as well that, that that's going to happen. So um, earlier in the year, in the spring, when we were doing lots of development work, um, there were a few notices to trainees to let them know about the, the system going down at certain times. Um, the team are on hand. Normally, I'd say probably between about eight and five every working day. So as Michael said, if ever you try and log on and you've got that sort of issue, you can contact them. Um, if it's out of hours, then obviously still send an email and the team will be able to pick that up the next day. OK, so I'll hand over to you now, Michael. OK, brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Um, I will share my screen again. Uh, so we're back here um uh hopefully you can see that uh, again do just let me know if you can't so earlier i gave you a uh, background uh, as to what the lep system was um so i'll just show you again that the first bit you just need to come to www.rcpath.org uh, and we're going to click into the new lep system and as i mentioned earlier you'll enter your college login details here that's a deep breath. Okay, brilliant. So um, this uh, is the first page uh, that you will see in the LEP system, and it will uh, tell you which uh, access, which type of access you have to the LEP system. Uh, so for you, uh, in your first year of training, uh, you will just have trainee. Once you're in your second year of training, you will see training and assessor because um, you can act as an assessor in your second year of training uh, if it's for a junior trainee. Um, so you will also have uh, assessor access. So I'm going to click into continue. Okay. Um, on your first login to the LEP system, before seeing this page, uh, you will see a separate page which will ask you to enter the name of your educational supervisor and your training program director. Uh, without these, you won't be able to get any further. Um, so once you've selected them, uh, you will then be taken to this page and, and every time you log into the LEP system, you will come directly to this page uh, after the, the page showing which access you have. Um, so uh, this is the left homepage. This up here is, is your navigation menu. Uh, the release tab is one place where you can change any of your professional relationships, but I can show you a little bit more in, in a second about that. You've got the alerts menu here. Um, so like Joe just mentioned, um, any notifications about let downtime uh, will be shown here. So as you can see, uh, there's one up at the moment, uh, just notifying uh, trainees and, and users of when the LEP system will be down. Um, here, you also uh, can access the instructional videos, which I mentioned earlier. Um, they are really, really useful. Um, they will show you how to do things uh, in a little bit more depth than I have time to today. So, um, you know, if you are struggling to do anything in the LEP system, um, obviously, we're on hand to help. Uh, if you email us, but it might just be that you can get uh, help quicker if you just go into there um, and, and you might find the, the relevant video. Um, but of course, if, if you can't, uh, do just do just contact us. Uh, you've got the tasks menu where any items that require your, assent, uh, your attention will show. Um, and we'll come back to this task here uh, in a little bit. Uh, you've got messages uh, over here. Uh, you can correspond directly to other LEP users um, using messages. Uh, and then, yeah, and then down here, uh, you've got the training cards, um, which shows your current year of training. 
uh, together with your ARCP date. Uh, that's if you've entered one and 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 if you if you know it. Um, the status of your educational supervisor's structured report, the SSR, uh, and then it lists the various relationships. So for the um the purpose of this video, they're all, all college staff. And uh, you've got your progress bars down here, which are really important. Um, as you complete assessments uh, throughout your training, the lights will turn green and you can see how you're, you're getting on. Uh, and you'll also see a little bit later on uh, how, how that works. So just one thing I'm going to show you very quickly, if you come up to the, the uh, freeze or horizontal bars up here, uh, which is called the burger menu, uh, and you click into profile. Um, so as it's a single sign on, uh, so you log in through the uh, college homepage, uh, you can only change your email address by notifying us or by changing it yourself through the college web page. So you can't uh, change that here. Um, but one thing you are able to do if you click into the edit tab is you can uh, upload a photo. Um, but do bear in mind, anyone with access to your uh, ePortfolio, which are those people that you list as your professional relationships, they will be able to, to see your photo. And then down here, there's a, a bit of information, uh, your anticipated completion date, um, along with your, um, your GMC number, um, if, if we have it, um, and the NTN number you can enter yourself. Uh, that's a mandatory field on the ESSR, so you will need to enter your NTN um, at some point um, throughout your training, um, and you can get that from your deanery. Uh, you can also set your job position and workplace uh, down here. And just do note that if your anticipated completion date that's showing here is, is incorrect, um, you'll need to contact the uh, the training department um, because uh, this date comes from our records uh, that the training team keep. So one of the very first things uh, to do when you first log into the LEP system uh, is to create your ARCP. Uh, the progress bars that I showed you on the homepage uh, will only work properly uh, if you create your ARCP. So if you come up to ARCPs and click in create and list. And uh, you will see the create tab uh, up here where my mouse is. Um, the LEP system only allows uh, one ARCP to be open at any point. So once you've started your ARCP, that create tab will disappear. Uh, this is one that um, I set up uh, in preparation for this uh, demonstration. But when you set up your ARCP, uh, you'll need to enter the ARCP date. Um, now, if you don't know that, uh, yet when you set it up, and, and, and that may well be the case um, this early on, just put in um, an estimated or fictitious um, date because you can change that later on. So that's exactly what I've done here. I've just put in the 31st of August. Um, and then when your deanery contacts you to say that your ARCP date is, is uh, say, the 26th of August, uh, you can just uh, come down and go into edit and change that. Uh, so the period dates uh, cover the whole training year, um, so uh, you can enter them as uh, the first day of your training um, and then just at the end of the, the training year. Um, that date there actually um, should uh, be extended to that date. The ARCP date um, will need to be in, in that training range. Um, I think that's just because um the lcp date at the moment uh, i just put in the the latest possible date um and then do notice uh that the blank relationship here which is the lcp panel chair that will be set by your deanery uh, when they start your lcp outcome form um which is done later in the year so you don't need to worry about that being blank at the moment as uh, so once you've um set your lcp up uh, you can start going with your assessments. Uh, so I'm going to come up into assessments and I'm going to click create and list. And we're going to go into create. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so for your first year of training, your MSF assessment uh, will actually be initiated by the college, um, which is why you can't see a create assessment tab uh, below the MSF assessment because the college uh, starts your MSF assessment uh, in the springtime. Um, and uh, once we've started that for you, it'll appear in your tasks menu to um, start that process. Um, but up here, you can create your workplace based assessments. Um, so as you use um, different assessors throughout your training, their names will populate here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll select myself as the assessor for this one. Uh, and we'll do uh, an ECE assessment evaluation of clinical management event. So we're going to create assessment. Okay. Uh, so the top part of the assessment uh, will auto populate from the information uh, that's that's in the profile and on record for us. Um, you can, however, backdate the assessment. Um, obviously, it recognises we're putting it in today, but it might be that you did this assessment a couple of days before and you only just got around to putting it on. Uh, so you can backdate it there. And then any mandatory fields um, that need to be completed um, for the assessment uh, are marked as such here. Um, so you can go through that. Um, as you can see, these ones here, um, you are can put in your comments for the ECE, um, but it is the assessor who will have the ultimate ability to amend them. Um, but for these ones up here, which are training fields, um, your assessor will not be able to amend them, but they will just review them once you have sent it off. Um, just bear with me one second. Um, so once you um, send that assessment off to the assessor, um, they it will obviously go to their let page um, and they'll need to approve it. And uh, once they have done that, it will come back to you uh, to associate it with the capabilities in practice and the generic professional capabilities, which um, Dr. Park showed you earlier on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the home page and uh, we've got an assessment that was completed earlier here in the tasks menu. Um, I approved it. The assessment, as you can see, was started on uh, last Friday, uh, the 22nd of September. And uh, what you'll need to do um, before this assessment is complete, uh, you need to associate it with the SIPs and GPCs. So when you come in, uh, you will have each of these SIPs that you can click into and read them uh, in more detail. What I'll do for this is I'll just select a couple of these SIPs. Now the generic capabilities in practice uh, are actually linked to the SIPs and auto-populate at this point. So based on the SIPs that I have selected, it has pre-populated the six uh, GPCs, but you might come down here and, and think, well, actually, hang on, what I uh, did, uh, it might, it didn't actually quite link with the, the leadership and team working. So I'm actually gonna deselect that one and you can change it to a, a different one. Uh, and then we're gonna add them. And then the very last thing for you to do uh, before this assessment is complete, uh, just come up into options, go into the ARCP, and this is where you assign the assessment to your ARCP uh, so that it appears to your panel uh, and your educational supervisor um, when they review all of your materials later on in the year. So if we go back to the home menu, uh, sorry, the home page, now that that has been completed, you can see down here that we have one dots and you have started uh, to fill out your, your progress bars. Uh, so it's really important to remember that all the assessments work on this basis, uh, that being that they need to be approved, associated to the SIPs and GPCs, and then linked to the ARCP 
before they appear in the progress bars. So if you think you've completed an assessment, but you can't see it in these progress bars, uh, do just check uh, if you've done each of those steps, because, um, you know, there, there will be times when when you you might think an assessment is is all complete and then you've just realised that you need to go back and, and, and link it to the ALCP. It can just be easily forgotten. And then once you've done that, uh, it will appear here. Um, so just very quickly, I will very briefly show you uh, a few other things you can do in the LEP system. So if I come into training development, uh, you can come into the personal activities. Uh, so you can, um, there's not actually any here for this uh, dummy record, um, but you can add any personal activities um, in this bit and um, once associated uh, to the ARCP as well, they'll appear in your ESSR at the end of the year. Um, and there's loads of sort of different things you can do as a personal activity. So as, as there actually aren't any showing, I will just quickly uh, show you the different types of things that you could include. Um, so anything uh, like here, you can actually add uh, this welcome uh, day presentation to um, your, uh, your thing. So that might go down as a, a course event. Um, and you can add that, uh, your new trainee welcome day as a personal activity, um, add any files you want to to it. Um, so you will be sent a certificate showing your attendance. Uh, and then also you will uh, be able to uh, associate personal activities to the SIPs and the GPCs. Uh, and then uh, you've got the training rotations, um, which you can go into up here. Um, and this is where you can record uh, different posts that you've had in your training. Um, so as um, Dr. Park mentioned earlier, it might be that you go out on a training post uh, to do the di different clinics that you couldn't do uh, at the hospital you were in. Um, and you can come into here and um, uh, show where your post is and, and what the dates were that you um that you were in that post. Uh, and finally, uh, you've got personal resources. Uh, these are just little files or URLs that you can you can update, uh, you can upload um, to your LEP system. Um, so just any additional um, certificates or whatever, but it's um, they're not essential but it's just any more evidence you want your panel to see uh, and again once you have uploaded these um, they will show in your ARCP once associated. Um, you've also got this help tab um, where there's loads of different documents uh, you can also get to the instructional vi videos here um, loads of documents uh, offering information on, on various things. Um, you will also be able to find uh, a lot of these documents on the website. And you've also got the report issue tab down here. Um, instead of emailing us, say you, um, you know, you can't remember the email address or something, or you've lost where you wrote it down, you can come in here. It's got our email address there, but you can also just sort of send us an email uh, directly through this uh, function and that will come directly to us. That's just another way uh, you can contact us. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's the very basics of, of using the LEP system. Um, as I say, uh, do watch the instructional videos um, if you want a bit more depth in, in different areas because um, they, they are a little bit longer on, on each uh, of the, the different areas and uh, they'll, they'll be uh, really helpful to you. So um, thank you very much for listening um, and I'll, I will be more than happy to take uh, any questions. Um, one other thing to note is it's not just me uh, who works on the LEP system, uh, myself and my line manager, Sandra Dewar. Um, so you might also hear from her, but unfortunately she couldn't be here today, uh, which is why you're only hearing from me. Uh, so I'll stop sharing and uh, pass it back to Joe and see if there's any questions. Thanks, Michael. Um, we do have one question. Um, so it says, uh, just so I understand the assessments fully, when we send um, an assessment, 
we complete what we think went well and what could be improved. Our assessor can then accept or amend those changes. We cannot leave it blank for them to complete their own assessment. Uh, yeah, so um, I think so there's been a lot of work uh, done recently with uh, our lab developers on the uh, different uh, workplace-based assessments. Um, I think in the, the majority of the assessments, uh, it will actually not be the case, uh, what you saw there. I think it's just the ECE, which is uh, the exception for that one. We have got um, more changes to come, as uh, Joe mentioned earlier. There, there's um, development still to, to go on the, the LEP system um, where uh, we're, we're changing uh, how different forms work. Um, but any of those fields that have a red asterisk in, um, you will need to complete before you uh, send it. But say uh, you don't know what to put in them uh, because they're under the assessor bit, you can just put into the box, um, your assessor, Dr. Jones, please put your comments here or something, because then the system obviously recognises there's text in there and will let you submit it. And then once the uh, your assessor has reviewed it, uh, they will will add their comments uh, into there, but as I say, that in most cases, uh, it won't actually ask you mandatory uh, to to fill out those those assessor uh, fields. Brilliant, thank you, Michael. Could I just ask you to um put the answer in the chat as well? So we'll any questions and answers we'll put up after the um with the recording of the webinar as well. Yeah, no problem. No. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so we're doing quite well. I think quite close to time. Um, so our final talk today is by a trainee, um, Dr. Josh Dewart, who's um, sat on the TAC for a few years now. Um, he can't be with us this morning, but we do have a pre-recording. So, um, Louis, could I ask you to sort that one out, please? Hello and a big, and a big welcome to you all. I hope you're enjoying your new trainees welcome day and that you're looking forward to starting your clinical training. I am sorry I can't be with you live today, but I'm delighted to be able to share with you to this recording some of my views and experiences working with the Royal College of Pathologists Trainees Advisory Committee. My name is Josh Newmark and I'm specialty training registrar in chemical pathology. I'm also the trainee representative for clinical biochemistry on the trainees advisory committee. The trainees advisory committee or TAC for short is run by trainees for trainees. Its primary function is to facilitate communication between the college and its trainees. Jenny McGinley in the training management team has asked me here today to offer a brief introduction to the runnings and workings of the TAC. So a big welcome. It's great that you're here. Pathology is a terrific career choice, with lots of different opportunities to contribute more broadly whilst progressing with your own professional development. For some of you, those opportunities may be in research. For others, those opportunities maybe an undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. And for some others, your interests may be focused on pursuing leadership and management opportunities. I would encourage you to get involved with those opportunities wherever you can. For me, I've found that pursuing those opportunities has complemented and enriched my training experience. There will be so many potential opportunities that await so make the most of them. And there's going to be lots to learn as well, of course. My advice would be to get stuck in, get fully involved with the work going on in your own labs and use those experiences to enrich what is your own unique professional journey. I just want to take a moment to appreciate the excellent work that has been undertaken by Matt Clark during his tenure as TAC chairperson. Matt worked to introduce many meaningful changes to the TAC and ably led the committee through the challenges of COVID-19. My thanks to him and I acknowledge use of some of his slides here. 
This talk will by no means be an exhaustive discussion of the Trainees Advisory Committee and its work. What I seek to do, though, in the next few minutes is to offer some takeaway messages for those who are interested to allow them to find out more. The four main messages will be the role of the TAC, membership of the TAC, how the TAC works, and getting involved in the TAC. So firstly, the role of the TAC. The role of the TAC can broadly be tackled as three main objectives. The first, and this is the TAC's primary role, is to act as the voice of trainees within the college. The TAC is there to escalate your questions and concerns about training. The second is to provide input into policies that have an impact on trainees, in particular changes to examinations and specialty curricula. The third main objective is to contribute more broadly to college work that involves trainees, including representation on other college committees, such as specialty advisory committees and college council. This really is just a small snapshot of the role of the TAC, but it does offer a flavour of the important role it fulfills. Okay, so you now have a bit more knowledge about the purpose of the TAC and how its work relates to trainees. Let's turn now to have a look at the membership of the TAC. And the membership of the TAC is diverse and it reflects the full breadth of training activity across pathology specialties. Specialty representatives are drawn from all 17 pathology specialties. So from clinical biochemistry to virology, there is a specialty representative member of the committee. There are additional members of the TAC representing professional associations that have an interest in training matters, such as the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland and the ACB. And there are other invited representatives there to provide perspective and allow dissemination of information about college activities regionally. The third point I want to discuss is how the tag works in theory and in practice. So how does the TAC work? This cartoon shows some of the most important steps involved in how the TAC fulfills its role. This is not always as linear as the diagram suggests, but broadly it reflects how the TAC usually works. Approximately 10 weeks in advance of its next meeting, all trainees across all pathology specialties will be contacted by the RCPATH training team to invite submission of questions or concerns that you'd like to see raised for discussion by the TAC. Trainees submit their questions via a dedicated online portal hosted by the college. The questions submitted for discussion are collated by the Governance and Committee Services Officer attached to the TAC. The collated questions are then forwarded to the Director of Examinations and the Director of Learning to allow them an opportunity to respond before being tabled for discussion by the TAC. The TAC meeting itself brings all members together in a friendly forum where each person's voice and views can be heard. There may be occasions where the matter being discussed is of particular relevance to one specialty or a small group of specialties more than others. However, most of the points discussed are of interest to all trainees. Recent examples have included cost of training, and equality, diversity, and inclusivity. Prior to COVID, meetings were held twice yearly, face-to-face -face in London. 
The circumstances of COVID presented an opportunity to explore new ways of working. And meetings have since been hosted virtually by Microsoft Teams. This presented an opportunity for even wider engagement by trainee representatives who are more geographically remote. This seems to have worked well. The meetings are usually scheduled in May and September. At meetings, the college president usually provides an update on work being done related to trainees and this allows the TAC an opportunity to raise matters of importance. Finally, TAC meetings allow an opportunity to propose new projects or raise urgent matters related to training. Finally, for those whose interest has been piqued, I want to let you know about how to go about getting involved in the TAC. Available trainee representative roles are advertised as and when they become available on the RTG PATH website. There's frequently a shout out for applications on the RC PATH President's monthly newsletter as well. So keep an eye out for these. It's a myth that only senior trainees can apply for a representative role. Trainees at early stages of training are welcome to apply if they wish even if you've not attempted or passed a college exam yet. Whatever stage you find yourself at, you will find yourself well supported in taking on a role. Righto. Hopefully that brief overview of the role and workings of the Trainees Advisory Committee has been interesting. And hopefully it's provided you with some food for thought. Please think about getting involved offering up some of your time to ensure that trainees' voices are heard. Trainees' contributions are valued by the college and help inform future policy and ultimately bring about impactful change. I would encourage those of you who'd like to become involved to get in touch via the details on the college website. All that remains to be said now is thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your trainees' welcome day and good luck in your training. Fantastic, okay. Um, just in case you're sort of wondering where to look on the college website, if you would like to get involved with the TAC, um, there's a webpage called Get Involved at the College, um, which if you Google it, you should it should take you there straight away. That's where all of the opportunities for anyone to get involved at the college are um, advertised. So have a, have a look there. As Josh says, there is, um, no um, barrier to joining the TAC. Um, you don't need to have a college exam or anything like that. Um, they're often very good meetings, um, very constructive um, and uh, hard work to prepare for, but um, but they are very good. Okay. Now, I know that we have about 15 minutes left for questions and answers, and we have answered the couple of questions that have come up during the morning as we've been going along. I can't see that there are um, any other questions that have popped up. Um, so I'm just gonna allow another sort of 30 seconds or so for anyone to put their burning questions in there if they would like to do so. Um, while we're doing that, I'd like to thank all of the speakers and the organizers for this morning. Um, as we said, um, the this will uh, recording of this will be put up on the college website. So if there are things that you would like to revisit, um, then you'll get notification when it's go gone up and you'll be able to go back and have a look and um, we will be obviously um, putting Professor Osborne's talk up for you in full so you can go and revisit that as well if you would like to. Uh, okay, so I can't see that we have any more questions. If something pops into your mind later on or later in the week, um, then we've given all sorts of email addresses of people that you can contact. Um, the other one, if none of those have, have stuck, is info at rcpath.org. That should also reach a relevant member of the team if you have any questions. Um, but in order to give everyone 15 minutes back of their day, 
Uh, I would like to say thank you very much once again to everyone who has presented and organised and also thank you to all of you for listening this morning. I hope you found it helpful and we look forward to um, being in contact with you very soon. Thanks very much, everybody.